IDC International Radio. From Israel to the world. You're listening to 106.2 FM IDC International Radio. This is a special panel roundtable uh, here at the ICT conference here at the IDC Radio Studios. Today in studio with us, we are very happy to have Dr. Shaul Shai, the research fellow at ICT and director of research at the Institute for Policy and Strategy here at the IDC. We have Dr. Eli Carmon. He is a senior research scholar at the Institute for International Counterterrorism, the ICT, and Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Policy and Strategy here at the IDC Herzliya. And of course, we are very blessed to have Ambassador Dimitar Mikhailov of the Republic of Bulgaria to the State of Israel. Uh, Dr. Mikhailov holds a PhD in Ancient and Medieval History from the Department of Arabic and Semitic Studies. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here in studio. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, especially during this conference, to uh, sit down and discuss with us what is happening in Syria and uh, the uh, movement of ISIS throughout the Middle East and uh, how we move forward from this situation. So uh, let's start things off. Ambassador, I also know that you were uh, stationed in Syria for quite some time. You studied in Syria. Um, my question is to you, how it must feel knowing what Syria was when you studied there, worked there, to what is going on there right now? What are your feelings towards the situation inside Syria? Thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be with you today on this nice program. Of course, uh, your question... Uh, throws me back some years when I I, I studied uh, and I graduated from Damascus University in Arabic literature and language. But this was during the 80s. It was a different planet, different time. It was the time of Hafid al-Assad. And you have a sense that it, the time has stopped and Syria was static and whatever, nothing happened actually. But now we have quite a different picture. Now we have a a dynamic that uh, goes uh, different day by day. So I wouldn't dare to use my previous knowledge as a crystal ball to look through it to the future. Rather, I would say that uh, we have sui generis situation right now with uh, both regional and international factors, with many, many non-governmental factors uh, and with still radicalization of religious sphere, we have both Sunni extreme, Salafi, Jihadi, neo-Wahhabi forms that Syria never knew. And on, on the other hand, we have something very worrisome. We have Shia extreme organizations inspired by the doctrine of uh, the governance of jurisprudence, Wilayatul Faqih or Velayatei Faqih in Farsi. So we have both these two streamlines developing into their extreme and uh, nobody could say what would be the, how it would look like the end game. And very interesting in that entire mess and, and all that you've explained there, there are also some major international, uh, international players as well right now in Syria, in Russia, uh, in the United States, Turkey right now. Um, how do you feel, uh, Dr. Shai, about the different countries that are involved right now inside Syria? And what type of a threat does that pose to one another? Are they? It, it, it just seems like a free-for-all right now when you have four or five different nations and fighter planes flying over the same territory. I think that uh, we are now in Syria and uh, in the rest of the Middle East at the uh, crossroad. On one hand, uh, we have... Uh, a new era in the Turkish involvement in the region, surprisingly more aggressive uh, inside Syria against the Kurds in Turkey and in the Syrian territory, um, upgrade of the relations between Turkey and, uh, and Russia that I believe that partly is translated in the Turkish policy in the Syrian theater. We have the United States um, two months before elections. 
So the American weakness uh, left the theater open to the other players to dictate the, the, the situation. And therefore, it's very difficult to say who will be the elected uh, American president and what will be the future policy. What is quite clear that it will take time to either uh, who will be elected to develop the American strategy in, uh, in, in the region. And the outcome is that uh, I think that Russia will remain for the near future, at least, a key player in, in, the, in the theater. And we have to take in consideration Iran. Iran as well enjoyed the American weakness in the, in the region. And the Iranian uh, involvement in uh, Syria, and I include in the Iranian involvement, uh, of course, the involvement of the uh, Hezbollah, I'm afraid that uh, this axis of uh, Shia axis, Iran, uh, in some way the at least elements within the Shia community and regime in Iraq are pro-Iranian more than pro-American. And of course the Assad regime and Hezbollah, the uh, ideas, strategic idea that first uh, called it uh, King uh, Abdallah, the Shia Crescent is closer to be um, implemented than ever before. And uh, Dr. Kalmon, something we have seen over the last little bit, uh, one other player in this uh, situation, conflict in Syria, is the state of Israel. Israel has uh, entered Syrian airspace on several occasions to allegedly take out a few terrorists, to take out uh, some Hezbollah situ uh, uh, infrastructure, and of course weapons convoys that were being transferred over to Hezbollah hands. Uh, in all of those situations, we have not seen retaliation against Israel from the Assad regime specifically. And uh, recently you had Israeli fighter planes in the, uh, in the sky and the Syrian regime claimed to have shot down an Israeli fighter plane and drone. This was disputed by the IAF, the IDF, and the government here. All uh, personnel were safe according to Israeli reports. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that a message was sent to Israel via Assad saying, here you are, stop invading our airspace. Um, that's a different message being sent, and that's a, a, a show of confidence from uh, President Assad. What are your thoughts on that, and how is Israel's reaction to that going to be? Uh, I think that the Israeli uh, political and military leadership were divided since the beginning. What exactly uh, is preferable for uh, Israeli strategic uh, uh, national interests? Uh, because uh, some thought that it's better to have Assad, uh, the devil we know, than uh, the jihadist. Others thought that uh, uh, Assad should be removed because he is indeed uh, one of the uh, worst uh, enemies of Israel. Uh, but uh, I think in the last uh, year or two, uh, there are two uh, things that uh, the Israel has decided. One is, uh, not to permit the building of a uh, Iranian Hezbollah platform a basis on the Golan Heights border, uh, which uh, in the Iranian uh, strategy should have threatened directly Israel, not only from Lebanon and from the Gaza Strip, but also from Syria, because the Syrian army was no more present there. And the second element was to try to uh, neutralize uh, as much as possible uh, the uh, more Islamist or jihadist especially elements uh, in southern Syria and uh, uh, not to provoke them or not to give them uh, any uh, incentive to attack uh, Israel. And in this framework, Israel has also developed a strategy of humanitarian support to the local population in order to uh, prove to the Syrians on the other side of the border, but also to the international community that we are a positive uh, element actor uh, in this uh, conflict. In light of the uh, uh, American weakness, I, th I think that from the beginning, uh, the situation that we see on the ground is the re result of uh, American decision to outsource practically uh, the conflict uh, to uh, regional powers, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, Turkey, 
and uh, we see the results. Uh, and also to play a very sensitive game with the Iranians because of the negotiations on the nuclear deal. So uh, Israel has uh, seen the need to coordinate with the Russians because the Russians have become really the main uh, uh, world power on the ground. And this is also new from the Israeli point of view until now, uh, in my opinion, uh, successfully. But I think there are a lot of dangers. We saw that there were planes, Russian planes, which entered our territory, and even a drone, which uh, our uh, Air Force did not uh, uh, kill down. So we are in a very uh, critical moment now to see how uh, the situation will evolve, what Israel should uh, have, because clearly Israel would like that the Golan Heights remain in our uh, uh, possession, uh, uh, sovereignty. So it's a very complex and sensitive game, and uh, uh, things can change from day to day. Uh, Ambassador, I, I, I keep coming back because you were stationed in Syria, you studied in Syria, you, you've gotten to know the Syrian people. Uh, this is, uh, I wanted to ask you your opinion. They have been in war for so long over the last five years. However this eventually ends, how do you think the Syrian people bounce back? Oh, it's a million dollar question. Uh, we may say that we do face uh, really tragical consequences that will change as a sea change the Syrian society. Syrian society always for the last, let's say, 4,000 years, and you have a powerful Jewish presence both in Aleppo and Damascus <coughs> with many minorities, uh, has been sort of mosaic. You have different uh, groups of uh, national people, denominations, living together, what we say in academia, in a convivencia, living uh, in a modus vivendi, accepting each other. But right now, we have a dramatic intrusion of new ideas. And I'm back to my thesis that, on one hand, you have the Wahhabi Salafi influence that had never been strong in Syria, because Islam in Syria is based on Sufi basis. This is a sort of soft, tolerant form of Islam. And on the other hand, you have a Shia intrusion with, with uh, after May 2013, very clearly with, with the participation of Hezbollah. But also you have, for instance, uh, the Afghani militia, al Fatimiun, who, according to some of my sources, started to settle in the same Damascus. And I find a complete irony here, because Damascus, by the turn of 13th century, has been decimated by Tamerlang. And Tamerlang and Hazara, the same very Hazara, genetically, they are related to the Mongol Empire. And now they are back being settled. New Mongols. Being settled, gentlemen, in Shari Amin, this is the Jewish quarter, next to Bab Sharki. So I find uh, this as a symbol, an irony, uh, uh, but a very bitter irony, because the Syrian society has been broken down. And as Colin Powell once said, you, you break it, you own it. This is it. From now, maybe we will have India-Pakistan scenario, sort of, or Yugoslavian scenario. How? this broken society could be patched in different parts. Because in my humble opinion, after so many bloodshed, these people could not return to the previous 4,000 years convivencia. It's a very interesting, enlightening historical answer. Um, uh, and wanting to, uh, to speak about different groups that are in Syria right now, uh, there are a lot of different rebel slash terrorist slash insurgent groups right now inside Syria. Um, we have seen a potential ceasefire agreement on several occasions by the United States and Russia, and uh, they have not necessarily held up. The interesting part has always been that they've agreed you can continue attacks versus two groups, one being the Islamic State, the other being Al-Qaeda's representatives inside of Syria. Recently, Jabhat al-Nusra, the, uh, the al-Qaeda representative inside Syria, has gone through a name change. 
name change Jabat Fata Al Sham now they are called. Uh, Dr. Shai, Dr. Kalmon, you have uh, have written two papers in the last little bit about that specific issue. Very interestingly, at the Herzliya conference uh, this past year, both of you predicted that this was actually a possibility that they would change their name and split from Al Qaeda. And there you go, three months later, uh, your prediction comes true, and you guys wrote another very interesting article on why they changed their name. Uh, maybe you guys could elaborate a little bit on why the Nusra Front is now uh, Al Sham. I think that when we look at this uh, step, of course, we need more perspective to analyze if uh, we are right or wrong. But uh, so far, uh, the, the facts are against the expectations of uh, the leader of the group, Giuliani, because both the United States and Russia refuse to accept the change of the name is the change of the identity of the group and uh, they are still on the uh, high priority of both uh, as a target uh, even during the, the, the ceasefire. But uh, I think that we have to relate to a point that uh, on the eve of the 9-11, uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri um, gave the, I call it the annual uh, <laughs> uh, message to the world and especially to the, to the United States. Speech to the Ummah. Uh, yes. <laughs> we are still here. <laughs> in, in, in some way. And uh, he didn't mention uh, that, uh, let's say, Jabba al Nusra that was in the, in the past, uh, let's say, the spearhead of Al Qaeda, let's say, in the, the, the most important uh, theater of uh, jihad. Um, so, in the past, he gave them, in some way, the permission. I don't know if this permission was given because. It was unavoidable, so it was better to do these divorces uh, in a more elegant way, or because indeed Zawahiri believed that this is the correct uh, step to do at uh, the time uh, being. So I think that uh, now uh, Jabhat al Nusra. Uh, I read a, an interesting article of uh, a Syrian expert that wrote that Jabhat al-Nusra from the very beginning adopted the doctrine of uh, Abu Musa al suri And according to the doctrine of Abu Musa al suri in spite of the fact that he was one of the, let's say, uh, experts of Al-Qaeda, but his point of view was more nationalistic than um, global, um, what is uh, the main characteristic of, uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda. And I think that this is the real attempt of Jolani on the background that both Zawahiri and Jolani are waiting for the fall of ISIS. And it's just a matter of time. I mean, Raqqa will fall. Sooner or later, I, be, I believe sooner. And then they are waiting to become the dominant player. This is the main issue. And it will be easier to become the dominant player in the Syrian theater, not as a part of Al-Qaeda, but as a representative of what the ambassador mentioned, at least the big parts of the Sunni uh, community in the Syrian society. I agree with uh, uh, Shaul and uh, uh, actually the splits of uh, Jabhat al-Nusra from ISIS. They were a member of ISIS under uh, Baghdadi. was not only the personal uh, ambition of Giuliani, but also the fact that they most of them are Syrians and they wanted to implement the Sharia and the jihadist <coughs> creed in Syria, not uh, globally and not even regionally. Uh, and I think that the change of name uh, is not intended so much to the great powers, okay, to change their, but internally, to permit more and more groups to uh, join them in the fight against the regime, and to permit to some Arab countries, especially Qatar, 
perhaps even Saudi Arabia, which are fighting Iran and the, uh, Hezbollah, and not only the regime, to give them support. And this, by the way, was one of the points when Qatar tried to buy uh, Nusra, uh, uh, proposing them $20 million in order to split from Al-Qaeda. And this happened. So I think this uh, is a tactical move from vis-a-vis -vis Al-Qaeda leadership, but it's a strategic move inside Syria and vis-a-vis -vis the Sunni regional powers. And uh, please, just to permit <coughs> me to add some more grist into the meal, beneath this conversation, we have to take into consideration that the very core of ISIS has been created by Iraqi security and army officers like Samir al-Khlifawi, Haji, Bakri, or others. So you have, in the essence, in ISIS, you have the cruel tools of Saddam Hussein repressive apparatus mixed with Salafi jihadi, attracting foreign fighters in the spirit of Abu Musa al-Zarqawi. And then if you look at the Nusra, and I, I was in Damascus when they started with the first uh, Piguim <coughs> attentats, uh, you have a clear nationalistic trend with local, I stress, local guys, local militia, who may turn, may grow beards and may turn Salafi as a tool to oppose against the Alawi regime. So. Uh, absolutely, I agree that uh, Abu Musab Sitmiri and Masuri is influential in that. But, of course, it, th this is an important difference. And for that reason, you see less foreign jihadi fighters in uh, Nusra, Jabhat Fatih Sham, and more, uh, far more in, in ISIS. But the big question is what will happen, as Dr. Shai said, what will happen after the day after? Of course, you have dispersion of jihadists, Hasve Khalila even in Europe, in Russia, here also Israel is not immun immunized. And then what will happen locally after you have ISIS destroyed? I think that we should be careful and we should be prepared for not a pleasant scenarios. And. Uh if ISIS were to fall, that uh, seems to be the prediction by many of the experts throughout this conference. Uh, it was mentioned again on this radio panel. Uh, it is I inevitable ISIS is going to fall. So the question then becomes, if ISIS falls, that means one of the uh, fronts of war that Assad is fighting how it would have been won. It uh, breeds a bit of confidence. Who fills the vacuum of where ISIS is right now when ISIS falls? Does Assad go in there? Does that become its own territory? Uh, it, it, does Nusra Front go in there and take over? Who would take over the sections that currently are held, at least in the Syrian portion of uh, the event, in the, in, in the sense that if ISIS were to fall, who steps into Raqqa and takes care of A, those people, and B, uh, gets control? Because at the end of the day, we know that this whole mess is about who controls what territory inside Syria. Well, uh, I will say something controversial. <laughs> I think that uh, it is very convenient for all the parties that ISIS exists. Because the only common enemy for all the parties, all the rival parties, Assad and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, Assad and the moderate, the Kurds in uh, Turkey, Iran, Russia, America, Saudi Arabia, is the ISIS devil. So according to the fight against this devil, they can agree and practically they can implement their real interests. If we look at the Russian intervention for the sake of fighting uh, ISIS, if we will count how many airstrikes were against ISIS and how many against other Assad opposition groups, we can see the truth, what, what is the real interest behind. So I am afraid that, first of all, we have to say that um, ISIS will lose the territory and uh, the people that they control, but they will not disappear. I mean, they will return to be one of the terror groups that will conduct suicide bombings and uh, other attacks and so on, and the ideology, of course, will remain with us for good. But then 
will come the real conflict over the future of Syria. Because then <coughs> nobody can hide behind this mask of fighting uh, ISIS. Then Turkey will have to put on the table the Turkish interests and the, the United yes. States and Saudi Arabia and all the rest. And then it will be a totally new environment. And um, this is the big uh, question mark. Yeah, indeed, I think, uh, by the way, we evaluated that uh, the fall of the uh, Islamic State or the Caliphate will provoke uh, uh, not a, a kind of uh, uh, mix between uh, al-Nusra and ISIS, but most of the fighters of ISIS will pass in Syria to the al-Nusra front uh, as individuals, <coughs> and this will strengthen al-Nusra, especially now that this is uh, uh, Jabha al-Fatah, Al-Sham. These are Syrian fighters, not the foreign Mo fighters. No, no, I speak the, about the Syrian and the Arabs, if you want. Okay. Uh, and uh, this clearly will strengthen uh, uh, Al-Nusra. And what uh, will happen, as uh, uh, Shaul has said, uh, at that moment, the two camps will be, for now we have three camps, okay, or three axes. You have the coalition of uh, uh, the regime with the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah and the Shias and so on. You have the coalition uh, of the opposition, Syrian opposition, with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, United States, uh, and uh, other countries, and you have ISIS, okay? The moment ISIS will disappear as a main force, you have the two camps. And then uh, the question is, what will be the balance of power? For the moment, it seems that with Russian support, the regime has uh, chances to conquer more territory or to control better what they have already, which is the main uh, urban environment, uh, urban territory. In my opinion, one of the reasons that uh, uh, Russians came in is the fact that the Iranians did not succeed with all what their in investment there. Uh, with all the militias from Afghanistan, uh, they didn't succeed in defending the survival of Bashar al-Assad. So they brought in, they convinced Bashar and the Russians to bring troops and especially the Air Force. Uh, and uh, this is a very interesting point which shows the weakness, finally, of the Iranian axis. And uh, I think Israel and other countries have to think how to weaken even more the Iranian axis. I absolutely agree, and uh, probably this was the visit of Qasem Soleimani in July in Moscow, where allegedly he said, uh, this is it, we're not able to hold it, we need uh, a help from, from the air. I, I think that my two colleagues covered perfectly the, s the Syrian part of the equation, but the big question mark is what will happen in Iraq, because ISIS covers third, more than thirds, of, of Iraq, and these are four Sunni provinces, especially Anbar province. So the big question mark, we, we, we shouldn't look at to, to, to the ISIS as only as a jihadi tool. It is a reaction of disappointed, disenchanted Sunni tribes in Anbar mainly province against the government of Nur al-Maliki, against the Shia dominance, which historically comes for the first time, because whatever power you have, be it Saddam Hussein, be it uh, King, being Ottoman Empire, always you have Sunni dominance in Iraq. And now, since the Safavid Empire, for the first time, and they, with derogation, they call them Safawiyun, you have a Shia power. So the big question mark, what will happen in the Sunni area, area after uh, ISIS is destroyed? Are we going to witness another awakening Sahwa movement uh, as uh, that of uh, Abdul, uh, uh, Abdul Sattar Rishawi who, who's been killed? Are we going to see what Sunni form of organization to just, just opposed to the Shia power in Baghdad will be? And this is a huge question and I don't have a straight answer. I don't know what will happen among the Sunni community in Iraq. I'd like to ask a question, uh, Dr. Mikhailo. What about the regime? Regime without Bashar al-Assad. What is the alternative, political alternative? Because I'm not sure that Russians uh, need him or want him. So is there a possibility of a change also in the regime camp? Certainly as a possibility, yes, but not at this stage. At this stage, Russian, Russians and Iranian, oh, clearly we, we see that they have different, different vision for the future. 
Iranians, uh, as Dr. Shai quoted uh, King Abdullah, they dream for the Shia Crescent. They dream, they dream that to, to, to create a new Middle East. Since the Fatimite uh, Caliphate in Egypt, Shia has been in, on decline. And this is their golden moment right now, to create a zone. We have to think in different categories, not states, a zone, starting from Iran till, till, till the border of Israel, uh, southern Lebanon, of Shia influence, including Bahrain, part of Kuwait, probably because third of Kuwait is Shia. This is a project. Russians, after the end of Saddam Hussein, they were out. S Syria was the last part of the domino. Once they entered in, in the beginning of the 50s with Aswan Dam taking over, over, over the Middle East, and then you have backwash <coughs> domino. So now they feel that uh, th this is their return to the Middle East. It's very important because the doctrine of the Third Rome, because the spiritual imagination of Russia as inheritor of, of the Byzantine Empire. There are many, many factors. But what I want to say is that Russia has a different vision than Iran. And at certain point, they'll probably they'll come to a collision point. And at that point precisely will we'll be, will stand the question, is Bashar necessary for us or for you? Are we in need of new tool as a Syrian regime that would be more open to the Sunni communities, to different communities that will go over. As in Yugoslavia, you have different stage whereby the old players are not needed. So you have to bring a new president, a new regime, a new facade, if you will. And do you think the people of Syria are going to ex uh, accept uh, Assad staying in power in any capacity? Because at the end of the day, this all started because of uh, the civilian population rising up against their government, forming rebel groups. Assad started to fight his rebel groups, and then the floodgates opened and all the other players joined the fray. Um, so my question is, is do you think that, okay, fighting has, for example, stopped, the Russian interest is being looked after, the Iranian interest is being looked after, Turkish, Americans. Who's taking care of the Syrian people's ambition that they don't want Bashar Assad anymore. Very briefly, I mentioned you, you're not able to think about Syrian people as a mono, monolithic unity right. no longer. So your question should be, what different communities will think about the future of C Syria? So you have an Alawite community with, who will certainly be hands-on <coughs> with, with Assad or whoever uh, keeps the, them united, but the rest of communities, it, it's uh, quite different. Uh, I, I think that uh, we must look to the region and not, or to the Sham, or Sham if you want, and not only to Syria. Because uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, taking in consideration the situation in Iraq, and by the way, also the Kurdish problem, uh, the uh, balkanization process here will continue. Uh, there is no reason that Montenegro and Kosovo are independent, and here the ethnic groups and tribal groups will not form uh, a new entities. And the main problem, I think, uh, when we look to the map, what will happen with the mass of Sunni, the mass of Sunnis between Baghdad and Damascus, because they are the majority in this territory. So how it will uh, uh, be a, a new entity, two entities, three entities, Kurds will be autonomous or independent. It's a very complicated map. And of course, this means the end of Sykes-Picot. Yes. I, I, I think that uh, there is a fundamental problem that all the countries in the region, without ex exceptions, no matter if they belong to the so-called moderate uh, Sunni group or to the Shia group, are against any change in the existence of uh, countries. So the problem is that even Saudi Arabia or uh, or the Gulf states, or Egypt, they all said Syria has to remain in the existing territory. This is one precondition that we have to take it in consideration. There is a good reason to do it, because uh, for uh, each of the countries, there are minorities that uh, demand uh, autonomy or independence and so on. 
and their interest is to maintain the, um, the existing uh, geopolitical structure. On the other hand, as my colleague said, um, it's almost impossible to put together all the, all the broken parts and to say, okay, we, we are going on. So, unfortunately, I'm not optimistic because uh, if I look at the different places in the world that this type of conflict uh, broke out, that let's say the beginning of the evil is the colonial system that made the Sykes-Picot agreement that designed the borders and put together all, all these elements. If I look at Afghanistan, Afghanistan from 1977-8 till today is a failed state. And not the Russian, not the Americans, not the EU, not the Pakistanis, nobody is capable to assemble it to one national entity. If you look at certain places in Africa, but the, the best example is uh, mm -hmm. Somalia. So relatively in Syria, it's a new conflict. It just, just five years. I believe that the Sunni community, which is majority in uh, Syria and minority in Iraq, and I, I return to your point and I completely agree that we cannot uh, make the difference. ISIS assembled them uh, physically, but they will not accept Iranian occupation. And I think that it's clear for the Iranians. And therefore, they prefer to reduce their direct involvement and to return to the classical uh, modus operandi of using proxies. So it was very interesting that two weeks ago, a Houthi delegation from Yemen came to Iraq to arrange um, uh, agreements with local Shia, uh, not with the government of Iraq, which is dominated by the Shia, but local militias that will support the Houthis against the um, Saudi Arabian uh, coalition in the war in Yemen. So I think that we are far, far from a uh, uh, stabilized Middle East. It's going to be a long period. I, I, I can't say how long, but uh, I don't see the, the, the end of the conflict in the region. Before we uh, finish up here, I wanted to get your guys' opinion. Uh, something that has gotten a little bit of press coverage, but not uh, as much as you'd hope. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Israel has been... A humanitarian, uh, a beacon of humanitarianism for the Syrian civil war. They have admitted civilians. They have admitted uh, Nusra Front fighters, Al Qaeda fighters, into Israeli hospitals, given them medical treatment. Have uh, even put Israeli soldiers in harm's way, crossing into the border to pull out some of these fighters. Um, my question is: Do you think that by Israel doing any of this, which has been, for from a moral standpoint, the right thing to do? Uh, when looking at, will this change the hearts and minds of any of the people that hate Israel on that side of the border? Some of them. I think some of them perhaps, uh, I mean, the people uh, which really are receiving this uh, support. Uh, but I gave uh, yesterday in the workshop an example. Uh, Ismail Haniye, the leader of uh, Hamas in Gaza, sent his wife and his children to be treated in Israel. Does he they change his ideology and his view of Israel? I don't think so. So it's good on the short term for the relationship with the uh, people on the other side, and especially with the groups, some of the groups which are fighting there. Uh, on the longer term, uh, if the situation will be such that in the, uh, in Israeli strategic interest will be kept, then there's a possibility that this relationship will develop in something more positive. Very interesting stuff, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us here on the panel. Uh, one last thing, Dr. Shai, Dr. Carmon, where could people go and read your things, as I have, obviously? Uh, of course, on the websites <laughs> of uh, both the IPS and the ICT. ICT. All yes. the articles and the materials are uh, 
available. And our Europe website to hear the, <laughs> the discussions. And of course, come to uh, 106.2, 1062fm.co.il. You can get all the latest from the ICT. Ambassador, do you have a social media account? Do you have somewhere where we can read any of your works? As a city ambassador, I, I'm not able freely to, I'm not a free mind, so to say, because in my capacity I express position, I express a government, but I have found in uh, IDC, uh, ICT, a real venue, a real friends, I feel that uh, I can work and express my mind, uh, but for the time being I confine myself uh, with only from time to time to write in Israel Journal of Foreign Affairs, that's it. That's uh, what we'll send people. Asking permission for rich article I, I write. <laughs> <laughs> Rightly so. That's where we will send the audiences to. Thank you so much to Dr. Shai, Dr. Kalmon, and Ambassador Mikhailov. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. You're listening to 106.2 FM IDC International Radio with a panel from the ICT Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.